my next guest today is quite simply the busiest jockey in the weighing room. Not only is the busiest routinely riding over 1,500 horses a year, uh, he's also one of the most successful. This is the 10th consecutive year that he's passed 100 winners, and he's been champion all-weather jockey on no fewer than six occasions. He is, of course, Luke Morris, fresh from Group 1 success in Germany with Alpinista. Luke, welcome to the show. Hi, Nick. How are you? Okay. Um, I'm very good, and it's great to have you, particularly here off the back of riding a filly to two Group 1 races for your, your boss, Sir Mark Preska, in, in Germany. How much pleasure has that given you this year? Yeah, it's been fantastic, and um, you're always striving to ride winners at the top level. So um, it's four years since Marsha won in Umfort, so um, it was almost feeling like a lifetime ago uh, riding a winner at that level. I mentioned your extraordinary industry. Is this something that's come about because you set out to ride as many horses as possible, or is it sort of just evolved in that way? Um, I think it's something that uh, growing up... Um, I was always very competitive and wanted to do well and wanted to succeed. So, um, you know, riding as many winners as you can. Uh, hopefully you're, you're, boating, you're hoping it will uh, open doors and open better horses. So, um, say, you know, I've always had a good work ethic and wanted to succeed. But I almost sort of presented it as though it was a lifestyle choice. And I was trying to get at whether it was really a lifestyle choice or whether you kind of found yourself on this treadmill and now you can't get off it. Um... Probably a little bit of both, to be honest. Um, when you're riding winners, you, you kind of don't want to get off that wave of um, of, of riding winners and, and doing well. So uh, there's almost a, uh, a certain fear of failure inside of you where you don't want to give those winners away and you're just striving to keep succeeding almost. And I mentioned that you know, you've come here off the back of riding a couple of Group 1 winners and, and not your first either, Guild Edge Girl and Marsha and others. Um, but for you, is there, a, is there an equivalence to all these winners? Do they all come alike to you? Or do the, do the bigger ones still stand out? Um, the bigger one says there's no feeling like it. And um, when, when Alpinista won in um, Hopcarton a few weeks back, it was, uh, it was almost that, that feeling was back again where um, when you ride a winner at that level, it, it really does give you a, a huge buzz. Whereas obviously it's great riding winners, but... Um, Riding your Monday to Friday winners, it's almost, I feel like it's your job and, you know, I should be riding lots of winners and, you know, you, you keep working hard to, to gain the top winners. This is Alpinista. And prior to this, she'd beaten one of today's art candidates, Torquato Tasso, who they're talking up a little bit in Germany. Would she have looked out of place in this afternoon's race, do you think? Uh, I, I think um, if she'd have handled the ground, she'd have ran a solid race. Um, Interesting, the, uh, the assistant trainer, William Butler, was, was very keen to, uh, to the boss to supplement, but, uh, you know, Mr. Housing, Mr. Housing and uh, Sir Mark, had, um, they had a plan in place, and, um, like I say, she went and won in Cologne last Sunday, so it was, it was clearly the right choice. I'll, I'll come back to, to riding for Sir Mark in, in a bit, but I, I wanted to rewind right back to when you're five, six, seven, you moved to Newmarket, and... You were you were inspired very much by your uncle, weren't you, Jason Tate? Yeah, um, I always remember he won the um, he won the Royal Hunt Cup on a horse of James Hughes's Refused to Lose, a good few years back, and um, I remember seeing that and thought this re this really is for me. By then, I'd I'd never actually touched or seen a racehorse, but um, I kind of knew then that this is for me, and it was interesting that when I used to go to school every day, we used to have to walk. Um, parallel to the horse walk and I see the horse every day and uh, I kind of knew then that um, it was a path I wanted to follow if, um, if, if I was good enough. Uh, how were you at school? I was academically fine, got all my GCSEs, sort of A's and B's, but uh, absolutely despised going to school and um, from the age of 12 or 13 I used to get on my BMX and uh, ride out one lot for Michael Bell before school and then look after my three, four horses of an evening. Despise is quite a quite a strong word. <laughs> was it was it really that hateful? Um, it probably wasn't that hateful, but um, my mind was elsewhere, and um, it was almost just counting down the days till till I left, and I could hopefully ride in a race. What kind of man was Michael Bell to ride for? Um, he was very good, and probably looking back, I didn't appreciate at the time everything he did for me because I was as a young jockey probably a lot like everyone else who's been in a situation you want to run before you can walk and you know I wasn't ready to be probably getting as many rides as I was at the time and 
he stopped me from riding through the winters on the all weather just to kind of prolong my claim and gain experience and and make the necessary improvement and um did that frustrating at the time at the time i I really couldn't understand it and you know i felt like well you know what's he doing to me but um looking back it was the best thing best thing that probably happened for me in my career and um i was able to spend a winter with gay wars house which is a fantastic experience and a winter with ben cecil in california so um it probably made me the person and the rider I am today. And say, looking back, I can't thank him enough, really. You're the 432nd guest to have spent time with Gay Waterhouse in Australia, I think, who sat, who sat in that chair. She's a, a quite amazing influence on so many people from so many walks of life and, and sections of the industry. What did you learn there? Um, it was a really hard school of graft. And, um, you know, it was, it was eye-opening at the time because I was riding probably nearly 20 or so morning, but, um, you know, I was like to have a few rides for her and um, and I learned so much and rode some, some lovely horses at the time as well, um, horses like Dance Hero, Bentley's Biscuit, um, some proper horses. What what was she like to, to ride in a race for? What were the sort of... Um, she was fairly straightforward to ride for as long as you did uh, you did what you were told <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was a great experience being out there and... Um, Say she was she she was a tough woman, but she was fair. Uh, is that reflected in your in your current boss, Sir Mark Prescott? Tough but fair. Uh, exactly, yeah. He's he's very meticulous, and um, I always think with Sir Mark, nothing's left a chance. Everything's, you know, it's done properly, and you know, the, the, if we get the result, it's through doing everything the right way. So how did it how did it start, you and Sir Mark? Um. I, I felt that everything kind of went in terms of I lost my claim. I rode a, a good bit for Clive Cox when I lost my claim. I was lucky enough to ride him a Group 1 winner. And um, kind of that path was just starting to really sort of finish. And um, I ended up riding a few horses for some art did that Did that just reach its natural conclusion, you and you and Clive? Yeah, I rode um, plenty of listed winners, a few group winners. Luckily enough, Guilt Edge Girl, you know, just out of my claim. And um, just... Um, it kind of reached that natural conclusion, really, where possibly the horses weren't running that well at the time, and um, and I I felt that 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 door was starting to close, really. And luckily enough, at the time, um, I started getting a few rides for Sir Mark through the winter when um, I think Seb Sanders was out injured and rode a couple of winners. And um, the following season, he asked me to come in and start riding work and just see how the relationship developed. And um, luckily, it worked well. And um, I think. Uh, one of my first rides from that year was a uh, filly called uh, Clinical and the Princess Elizabeth Oaks Day, and she won. She won the Group Three, so it kind of it almost just took the pressure off that season, and um, it made me kind of fit into the role quite naturally. So, how different? How different is it to ride for Sir Mark compared to any other trainer? Um, I enjoy it because uh, you know I spend plen- plenty of time riding work in the mornings there, and you get to know the horses, and also you get to know the. The pedigrees have got a lot of, you know, influential owner breeders, Mr. Housing, Chivley Park, Dempford Stud, and you kind of get to know the fit of what each horse's career is going to progress to, and um, and how and how they'll, you know, how they'll be campaigned. So it's it's nice because you you almost feel part of the team, and you almost feel part of that horse's career. So you look you're looking at it in the round as well as just I need X many winners next week. You enjoy the development of, of horses. Yeah, exactly, because um, the, you know there are some horses that uh, get a lot of uh, big backward um, two-year-olds where we know that um, I'm sure this horse is going to come good and he's going to he's going to reward us. So um, you look after them accordingly, and um, you know it's, it's nice to see when they reward you. And a year down the line, they rate fifty pound higher, and you've uh, got six or seven winners out of them, and they're they're at black type level. So it's it's lovely to follow those horses' careers and. Um, be part of them. Now, here's an interesting here's an interesting point to, to touch on. Well, you've touched on it, and I'll expand on it. So you have plenty of people watching now be saying, oh, yeah, well, we know how you do it. You get a big backward two-year-old, nice pedigree. It, you have three quiet runs as a two-year-old over a trip that it's got no chance of winning over, and then bingo, you get a rating of 54, and out you come and win six races the next year. Now, I've always said, if it was that easy, everybody would be able to do it, but they're not able to do it. So why... Is Sir Mark Prescott so good at developing a horse's career like that? Um, I think, like, these horses, they're running over as far as they can at the time. You know, their two-year-olds are running over 
you know, mile, mile and a quarter, whatever, seven furlongs at the time, when a seven furlong race are out. So they're, they're running as far as they can at the time, but like I say, he, he's able to um, develop the horses where, you know, he'll, he'll conjure them more improvement out as a three-year-old. Once they get stronger, they develop, and um, they're, they're stepping up and trip gradually and learning on the job. So um, it's, it's lovely to see this horse improve, and um, it's great when the owners and breeders are able to get black type from these horses. But it's a delicate balance, isn't it, between making sure you're bringing them on quietly on the on the race course and trying to stay one step ahead of the handicapper. On the other hand, a lot of horses, you, you stick three quick runs into them and they fall apart on you and you've got no horse left at the end of it. Yeah, like I say, it's, um, it's as much about training their minds as it is training them physically, but um, I should say Sir Mark's um, a, master, a master at doing it. It strikes me you like that level of detail. You like things to be precise, is that right? Um, yeah, like I say, you learn with Smark, everything's meticulous and as I said before, nothing's left to chance and um, even when we go through the races, you know, we could be going through the 920 at Wolverhampton and it's um, it's done the same detail as a filly running a group one or etc. So um, it's nice to be to be on the ball and um, I've learned since riding for Smart that, you know, you have to really be precise and I study all my races the night before on the iPad, do a lot of video form, just so that um, you know you've, you've you've got to be on the ball in this game. And um, if you can be one step ahead of your competitors, it gives you a slight edge. And would would he be someone who accepts that you can make a mistake, or does he find it hard if you've made a mistake? Um, I think a lot of it is we'll discuss the race and. We discussed the way the best the best way to ride the race and approach it. And if you do what you're told, then generally you're, you know, you, you've done the right thing. And it also leaves um since the longer I've ridden for him, the more you, you've got a slight rope of your own. Where if you think think things aren't going right in terms of a race, then you, you can improvise and do what's best for the horse. Tell me a little bit about how you've developed as a as a rider and as a jockey. Because nowadays somebody said to me, "Well, you know." In the 80s, you could identify every jockey just by looking at the screen, and you can't now. They all kind of look quite similar the way they ride. You have a very distinctive style. Anyone can spot Luke Morris in a in a race. It's much more dynamic and can be look a lot more urgent. Is that something that that you develop consciously? Um, I don't know really. It's um, <laughs> I, I guess it's something that it, it feels it feels to me more comfortable, and um, I think. Naturally, I've I've developed tactically a lot better since riding for Smart because there are there's much more emphasis on how the race is going to be run, etc. But I generally am someone that you know I'm, I'm I'm quite busy in a race and but I think it suits me and I'm able to conjure as much of, out of the horse as I can. And, and sort of when people are, are sort of slightly disobliging about that style, what do you what do you say to them? Because they say, oh, he looks really sort of untidy and ungainly. Um, I think that um, it gets the best out of the horse and um, like I say, I'd like to think that by riding winners at the top level and riding, you know, I think it's 10, ten years of 10 centuries consecutively, um, I think it proves that um, it's certainly effective. Yeah, absolutely, because you don't want to change what feels good to you, do you, as a sportsman? You, you have to feel that that it's natural. Yeah, like I say, and, you know, I have done bits and pieces to try and try, try and work on it, but... At the same time, you, when you have a certain, certain way where it feels natural, it works, and um, you kind of don't want to take that, um, almost that nuance away from yourself. A, a lot of people that you've ridden for, who who I know, will say that your greatest strength is your is your judgment of not only your own horse, but what else is in the race. Is that a side of riding that you really enjoy? Um, I think so. Yeah, I think um, it's something where. You, you, you can gain an edge, and um, in in a sport where it, there are short margins, etc., you need to try and um, you know get, gain every edge you can. Um, one of your most famous victories, but it wasn't. To be honest, I feel I, I kind of feel bad because it's it's a famous victory, but it's almost more famous for what happened to the the runner up was your win on Marsha in the in the Nunthorpe, but still a, a very special win on a very very special horse. Just tell me a little bit about this day. Um, it was quite funny because this day. Um, She'd, she'd been a bit disappointing through. She won the Palace House first time of the year under a penalty, which I thought was a superb performance. And um, subsequently, she got beat a couple of times. And 
we kind of went into the race with almost no pressure because you know, we, we didn't think she could beat Batash or Lady Aurelia on the day. So it was almost a, a real no pressure ride. And uh, we rode her to literally try and get there as late as possible because we, I think I'd got beat in the Sapphire on the time four by probably going a fraction too soon. So um, literally tried to seal on her for as long as I dare and, and put her there on the line. And thankfully it worked out well. Now, now at this point, Frankie Dettori thinks he's got the race won and he still thinks he's got the race won and you're coming hard at him. He celebrates. Still looks as though he's won in a certain angle. What did you think when you crossed the line? Um, I, I really didn't know at the time, but um, as soon as I glanced over and seen um, <laughs> Frankie celebrating, it was a... Do you, was there any bit of you that thought, hang on, mate, you've got this wrong? No, you just you just wouldn't expect um, to, to fr- Frankie to get it wrong. So it was a, it was a, it was an absolute element. It was a it was a moment of absolute despair when, um, when I thought, oh geez, I, I haven't got quite got her up. And subsequently, when the the photo came through, it was a it was almost a, a real sent changing of emotions, and I, c- I couldn't quite believe it at the time. So you were completely resigned. You were like, right, I'm second. That's that. Yeah, I was absolutely distraught because. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, I've timed it just right, and uh, subsequently it worked out well. Did did he say anything to you? Had you exchanged words by this point or not? No, because I think we pulled up at uh, different parts of the track, so um, I didn't see him till we, till we got back in the waiting room. He was just doing his big thing, and then suddenly it's first Marsha. Yeah, like I said, it was a, um, it was, it was, it was a great relief, and, um, you know, it was a fantastic day. Um, in terms of satisfaction after a win, where did that one rate? Was that the most satisfying? I think so, yeah, because um, at the start of the year when she won the Palace House, I thought, you know, she, she could well um, carry all before her this year. She was she was favourite to beat Lady Rudy in the King stand, and she subsequently ran well all year, but, you know, the pinnacle of her season was the Numthorpe, and on that day, I thought she was she was absolutely superb. I mentioned at the beginning of the interview that this is the 10th consecutive year you've ridden over 100 winners, uh, you would normally get to 1,500 odd rides in a year. Yeah. And you won't this year because of the one meeting a day rule. Um, how do you feel about it? Um, probably when it came in, I would have been the big, biggest advocate for it um, you know, and, and totally against it. Subsequently, since it's gone on, um, it does swing, some, swing in roundabouts in their days when I pick up rides where potentially I wouldn't because X, Y, Z's gone to the other meeting and... Um, Sometimes on a SAS it's quite nice to uh, to be at Newmarket and then not dash to Wolverhampton for, for a few more. But um, I thought that the, the way it's played out, it, it kind of opened up scope for, for instance, next year with, you know, with the fixture list still as packed as ever. There's going to be six meetings today on a Saturday. For, I thought it left scope for potentially doing one meeting on a Saturday and maybe changing it to so you could ride seven meetings a day because it's quite nice one day a week to to have a day off and put your feet up and the way it is now with you've got, you've got one meeting on a Sunday etc oh, you see. quite often find yourself a lot of jockeys on a Sunday going racing for one ride because you've got 250 jockeys all wanting to be at that one meeting on a day so I just thought it you know the pilot scheme with Covid it worked well but I thought it left scope for almost meeting people in the middle and doing that way you could potentially have a Sunday off because I think today's the first Sunday I've, I've had off for five or six weeks with um, what are you doing here <laughs> yeah with, 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 with foreign foreign travel etc uh, well it's very kind of you to come I've got to say uh, so what you would almost say is okay Monday to Friday I could ride one meeting a day Saturday I could do the new market Wolverhampton thing because I'm working anyway may as well do a bit more have Sunday off would that suit you better than say ride Monday to Sunday one meeting a day yeah, I think I think there'd be other people in that camp as well because it, it is nice, even if it's say there's two meetings on a Monday and you haven't really got much, so take your Monday off, do your two meetings on a Saturday, and you can spend your day with the family rather than I think the way it is now, seven, se- you know, you race seven days a week and you often get a Sunday, and as I said, you see a lot of people going for one ride. Am I right in thinking though that in in contrast to quite a lot of your colleagues who will. Uh, I, and say, saying moan is, is a is a that's a bad word to use because it makes it sound like I'm I'm belittling them. I'm not, but who will 
not be that enthusiastic about the prospect of three or four rides on a freezing cold February afternoon at, at Wolverhampton. In contrast to them, you embrace that. Um, I'm just highly competitive and I want to win and um, like I say I, I, I enjoy going racing and riding winners. So um, I think the day that you lose that that hunger inside where you don't want to go racing, then I think that's the day when you're on the slippery slope. And you actually enjoy all of it, not just a little bit of it? No, I enjoy it all. I've um, kind of I've been engulfed and wanted and been... Say slightly obsessed. Probably since I was six or seven, I was, you know, I was following racing madly since the age of then, and I'm probably still as hungry, and I've still got that desire burning as much now. And are you happy to to follow pretty much the same path for the next few years, or are there other avenues you want to explore? Or would you, you know, spend time abroad, or are there other things you want to do? Um, I've. Uh, I've, I've always wanted, there's always been an itch to scratch to, to go abroad one winter. Um, obviously, I've been very busy through the winters since, since I lost my claim. I'd, I'd love to one day try Hong Kong. It's, um, it's an avenue that is probably the jockey, toughest jockey colony in the world and it's tough to break into, but that's somewhere I'd, I would love to try one year and, um, you know, ho- hopefully that, that, that chance comes one day. And um, But, uh, you know, I, I just want to keep busy riding as many wins as I can and stay competitive and um, try and ride winners at the top level. And your family life is going to take over as well? Yeah, like say, um, Molly's uh, due on the 27th of November, so uh, it's uh, an exciting time, but, you know, there's definitely an element of uh, slight nerves and, um, you know, it's going to be a big change. You see, I'm trying to work out whether this means you're going to have fewer rides on the all-weather this winter or in fact, you're going to work even harder on the all weather this winter, as the prospect of staying at home means even harder work. Yeah, uh, quite a few people have said to me, "Oh, you'll be um, you'll be booking yourself in for seven at uh, Newcastle on a wet Friday night yeah. uh, to, um, to 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 get away from the screaming <laughs> and shouting." But uh, it's an exciting time, and it's uh, it's going to be a big change in the household. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. The nine thirty, you can definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, nothing had changed. Luke, thanks so much for coming in. Brilliant. And best Thank of you. luck for, for the rest of the week. Where are you this week? Um, Lingfield, Kempton, um, I think Newmark at the end of the week. So a uh, bu- busy week ahead.